Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Nuggets News or our monthly housing and economy update with our friend Martin North. It feels like it's been a little while, Martin, but that's probably a result of a crypto bull market and many other things. But um, what a time to be alive. And today we're going to be talking all about uh, what's going on, but particularly the yield curve control and the bond market, these rising yields and inflation, because central banks have literally changed the recipe or their formula and even what they're sort of targeting, but there's no, I guess, straight answers out there. So it's all a bit of a mystery. Martin and I will try and uh, demystify that for you. But uh, first of all, how have you been, Martin? Yeah, busy, horribly busy. Uh, like yourself, there's just so much going on. I don't think I've ever been so busy in all the time I've been doing this stuff. And, you know, the backcloth here is uncertainty, right? There's so much uncertainty and there are so many conflicting signals. And frankly, if you go onto YouTube, you can pretty much find every opinion under the sun from it's all going to be highly inflationary to it's all going to be deflationary to crypto's booming to crypto's going to crash to, you know, central banks know what they're doing through to central banks have no idea. So you can pay your money, you can take your choice. Well, crypto does both all in one day, Martin. So um... <laughs> Exactly. So where do you sit, Martin? I mean, traditionally, where have you sat on that inflation versus deflation scale and have you changed your opinion recently? So I am still slightly more deflationary than inflationary and I've been in that mode for a number of years. But the reason for that is to look at the evidence from uh, Japan, who's been at longest in terms of quantitative easing and the ECB, neither of whom has actually been able to generate any inflation of any significant size, despite the fact that Japan owns, Central Bank of Japan owns probably more of the Japanese economy than any other country, and they've been at it for you know a good number of years. Yeah. And of course, other central banks are following on, the Fed is following on, the Reserve Bank in Australia is following on, you know, the Bank of England, they're all doing it. The thing to question is whether the quantitative easing strategies that they're actually chasing will actually really lead to real what I call structural inflation. Now, I've got to be careful here because there will be some inflationary blips simply because we had massive stimulus short term relating to the virus. And then, of course, that's being withdrawn. So we saw in Australia there was a significant uprise in the costs of childcare, right, which fed into the inflation figure because they basically paid for childcare for a period and then stopped paying for it. Yeah. Right. Now, that's not the same as wages growth. Right. Yes. And so for me, the critical indicator of inflation really happening is an acceleration in wages growth. Yeah. And in Australia, if you look since 2011, 12, in real terms, wages have gone nowhere. Yeah. Absolutely nowhere, right? And it's true also in other countries around the world too in real terms. So there's no sign yet of any wages inflation. In fact, the, the Reserve Bank has basically said, don't expect any wage growth until unemployment drops probably below 4%. Mm. And um, that's going to take years. So therefore, they're saying, well, we'll have to keep the rates really low and we'll go on doing quantitative easing for as long as we need to to support the economy. So that's the sort of official view, right? Now, of course... There are people out there saying, well, hang on a moment, oil prices have gone up to you know, 70 US and we are seeing the cost of food rising, et cetera, et cetera. And so that then takes us into, so what are you measuring in terms of inflation? And you and I have discussed previously that the official measure of inflation isn't necessarily reflective of reality yeah. on the ground in terms of people's experience. And I have this theory that if you'd applied the old calculation basis, for inflation in the US in 2005, they would not have had to have taken rates so low, they would not have created the global financial crisis, and they wouldn't have created the current crisis. So in a way, you yes. know, what are we measuring in the first place? Yeah, it's all just part of the smoke and mirrors approach that they take these days. Um, and as you say, it's that word uh, transitory, Powell and all these other central bankers just keep saying, well, it's no, it's just transitory little spots of inflation. But mm -hmm. The, what they're kind of uh, welcoming now is, as you just said in Australia, even with the wages, they're saying, well, if wages are going to be flat, and here we are on one hand, we've got, oh, house prices are going to go up 30%. They're almost uh, welcoming like negative real returns and it's telling people that you're going to be falling further behind, but we're almost happy to do that because it's, going to, it's what it takes to get the economy going. So 
Um, well, the, you know, Lowe keeps saying you, if you want returns, you've got to take risk, right? So what they're trying to do is to get those savings out of people's deposit accounts. And, of course, the savings ratio went up because people weren't spending and they got all this handout from the government. Yeah. Um, but what Lowe wants and what the Fed wants is people to actually invest in the markets. In other words, do more of the same, right? And it's just worth reflecting on this, right? The total debt outstanding around the world is about 281 trillion at the moment. 28 trillion of additional stimulus has been created in the last 12 months or so, right? That's yeah. a huge proportion, right? We've never been that high. And so the real question is, is this another leading indicator of, if you like, cracks appearing in the overall superstructure and substructure of the international economic structure that we have around the world or is it just temporary now you know you could argue fed's been at it since um the global financial crisis and of course significantly over the last year and they have to continue to do this for another two to three to four years well you know 100 billion you know um, oh, <laughs> every yeah. time they do it and they're going to do it a lot a lot more times this is going to put ever more pressure on but i think what I come back to is real people in the real economy versus all, all of what's going on in the financial system and, you know, bankers and the sort of the, the duality that's being created. No wonder people are wanting to get more control by going into the crypto world. Yeah, as you say, like they've just decided that um, savers are going to be punished or there's no way to save as well as you have to speculate to get in front in life and that's where people are looking for alternatives as Martin's just said. But uh, I guess my views on inflation have been recently that it all changes once you can go directly to the person. So QE, everything we've just described and everything they've done and in Japan for 30 years, in other markets for the past 10 years or so, hasn't led to inflation because it doesn't get into the real system. Now that they're starting to do stimmies or if we do the central bank digital currencies or digital yuans, whatever it is, if you're putting money directly into the hands of people or governments want to start doing um, massive spending, whether it's going into debt or they're going to have it all monetized directly and we do uh, modern monetary theory, uh, any of that sort of thing hasn't really been done before. So if you're doing that and then the money isn't going to the banks or reserves or even into financial markets like it used to, it, it can go directly into food, housing, commodities, all those things. And I think uh, that's just not even debatable that we would put up the, the costs. Inflation would happen if, if that takes place. So I guess it's a question of are they going to do that? Do they have the technical means to even do that? And for me, they're walking that line without even realizing it. I think they're taking the same approach and saying, well, instead of doing 10 trillion of, of that style, let's do 10 trillion of this style. And they, they're not realizing that this could cause massive inflation very quickly. And then it's hard for them to put it back in the box. Right. Well, I've got this theory also that banks and analysts are quite keen to talk up inflation right and there's a reason for that and the reason is to do with what's going on in the bond markets mm. which we, we better dive into man <laughs> okay yeah well why don't we do that because it really you know the bond market in a way for me is the leading indicator of what of what's really going on right and um so if you look at what's happened in australia uh the reserve bank basically sent set a three-year bond rate target um, and then they struggled over the last few weeks to keep to that target. Yeah. And so they changed the rules, right? So last week, they forbid the Treasury to effectively lend on their Treasuries so that people couldn't short the market anymore, right? <laughs> and what that did was then pull the target rate back down to where they wanted it. In fact, there's a, there's a couple of charts there you might want to, to show with the, the three-year rate so uh, sorry, what Mark three. is saying here is on about March 9th, so basically, well, yields and bond prices are inverted, which we've covered many times. Yep. So they're banning people from um, shorting the market. Is that what you're saying, Martin, to bring those yields Correct. back into... So, so people were shorting the market, right, which yep. basically then lifted the um, the, bond, yep. the bond rate, right? Yield, As you say, yep. price and yield in inverted. Um, but basically the Reserve Bank has now stopped Oh, shorting in Australia became really much more expensive last week. Okay. So, so they've basically taken that card off the table. So many people now are actually, uh, you know, following on. Although interestingly, there's still upward pressure on even 
the, you know, the, the, the three year, the 10 year in Australia, which is the other the other chart actually is significantly up and it's been consistently up. Right now, yeah. the reason for that is partly what's going on locally, but fundamentally what's going on in the in the US. Right. And in the US, we have exactly the same issue. The 10 year US is is up really very high now compared with where it was. But there is something which people don't ha have naturally understood. At the end of March, the Fed is changing the liquidity requirements for the banks, uh, which I means they yeah. will need more bonds, right? 2% more bonds than they currently need. This right? is the uh, temporary... Um, don't worry too much about your reserve ratios. Correct, um, exactly. So they knocked it down to say, look, we want you to lend, just lend, 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 lend. We'll give you, you know, so so they not knocked it down in the crisis, right? And so banks were encouraged to lend a lot more, although they didn't really in the US, right? They they tended to go in and do other things, right? But that that liquidity ratio is going to revert at the end of March, right? Now, the theory I've got, and a few other people, not many, but a few others, is actually the banks are knowing they're going to need to buy more bonds, are actually trying to get the price of bonds down. And the way to do that is to talk inflation up, right? Uh, yeah. So the point there is, if that is true, and we'll know, you know in a few weeks' time, this is not inflationary. Yeah. <laughs> this is actually a, another sign of deflation. Mm. Okay, so, we'll so, so what Martin's saying is that these big banks, they need tier one capital. They need like US bonds as at a certain fraction or ratio um, in their reserves. And the Fed can almost use these big banks as their lever to, to, get the, to get the banks to do the heavy lifting for them, to do the QE for them almost, to buy all these bonds. So, uh, and, and just, just come in on that. The key point there is the Fed needs the banks to buy bonds the banks need to buy bonds because basically their ratios require it, if, if they're going to lend more, right? And given the fact that, of course, the Fed is, you know, doing quantitative easing, so they're actually flowing more into the system, they need the banks to buy more bonds. Yeah. So there is a closed system here that people haven't understood, right? And therefore, this is not a normal inflationary environment, and the bond yields and rates aren't necessarily signaling what most people think they are. So what Martin just said there is if the central banks want to do QE, well, what QE is, is buying bonds off the big banks. And so they need those banks to... This is the problem they had in Japan. There literally Correct. wasn't enough bonds to even buy. Yep. And they yep. started buying ETFs and everything they could to just try and prevent things from looking like they were caving in on themselves in deflation. This is the central bank's big fear. So hopefully all that... Uh, makes sense. And Martin, we've um, we've had some juicy conversations already. We're on slide one. <laughs> well, you always know we have a juicy conversation. You know, who needs slides? I <laughs> know, oh, I know. Oh, uh, should we should we go to the next slide? Yeah, why don't we? I'll, I'll, I'm liking this background, Martin. There's a bit of a fresh uh, facelift. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I did this a few 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 months ago. You know, blue shirt, blue background. You know, a bit of a bit of refresh there. So <laughs> very very cool. Walk, okay. walk the world. So this is the uh, unemployment rate seasonally adjusted. We can see it's come back down a, a lot, but that yep. last little percent or so, the central banks are targeting even lower. They're saying that this is going to take you know years. So what's interesting is the employment rate yesterday came out at five point eight percent, right? Unemployment rate, which was much lower than everybody expected. It's ten months sooner. Yes. One than what the Reserve Bank predicted very recently, and you know even worse if you go back what the Treasury said. So something's going on with with the uh, employment rate, and you know, eighty ninety thousand jobs were created. Most of them were full time jobs. Most of them were actually for women. Uh, New South Wales and Victoria was where a lot of the action was, and a bit in Tasmania too, right? So it all looks pretty good. But then you've got to ask, well, hang on a moment, what types of jobs are they? Right. And the other chart there is underemployment. Now, underemployment means people are working, but they're not actually working for as many hours as they want to. Right. And it's the underemployment, which is the critical point, because underemployment essentially says that whilst people might actually be officially defined as employed because they're working more than an hour a week, right, 
in reality, they're not necessarily fully employed. And the, Roy Morgan's alternative unemployment rate is 13%. Right? So it's going to be very interesting to really understand what the true situation is. What we do know is that youth unemployment uh, dropped back a little as well. And, uh, you know, women were actually uh, advantaged relative to men as well. So there is some good news in the numbers, but it's not uniformly good. And the question now, of course, becomes what happens when JobKeeper ends at the end of March? Right? Mm. Because we know that there is what, about a million people who are on JobKeeper still down from 3.5 million, so that's a significant improvement. But there's a lot of people. Right? What's going to happen when JobKeeper disappears at the end of March? Now, most people are saying that will actually create a rise in unemployment. The question is, how much of it? At the conservative end, people are saying, well, it might be 100,000. Other people I've read suggest it could be 350 to 400,000. Nobody quite knows, right? But this is not uniform across the country, right? Yeah. And um, if you go to the next slide, I've just shown you the distribution of JobKeeper for Melbourne, right? Yeah. So the reason I've done it down to a postcode level is to highlight this is not uniformly spread across the country or indeed if, in Melbourne. But there are pockets. If you look at the west of Melbourne, you know, Point Cook and where it be around there, or if you go over to Danalong, there are very high proportions of people there who are on JobKeeper. Now, the question is, what proportion of those people will then start showing up in the unemployment numbers? Right? And there's another interesting correlation, and that is, if you recall my mortgage stress mapping, which I've shown you here previously, right? there's a very strong cross-representation between the people on JobKeeper and high mortgage stress. So it could well be that we see an uptick in unemployment over the next few months which is going to make it harder for the Reserve Bank to reach now its four-point-something target, um, you know, because they're saying, well, we need unemployment way down to get wages growth to come through, which is why we need low interest rates, right? So that's the first point. But the second is the consequential impact on real people across Australia is going to be very significant. And I'll give you another example. In Tasmania, Launceston is another hot spot. There are a lot of job keeper people in the law at the moment. Now, the question is what proportion of those will get work or what proportion will appear on the unemployment numbers? So whilst 5.8 superficially looks quite good, watch this space. Yeah, e exactly. It's the, the tourism and you know those those regions that are dependent on the things that just aren't, aren't flowing like normal still. <laughs> well, but of course, you know, the government then introduced this um, um, air, air, you know, airline um, support process, right? Basically, all these half price flights, which will help, you know, the airlines. And it may help the few locations that they've selected a bit pork barrelish in my mind. But yeah, it's not going to be sufficient to... Uh, support all of those people who are moving from JobKeeper. Uh, and, you know, I, I look at places like Cairns who have very high representation in JobKeeper, so they might get a bit of benefit because that's one of the areas where people have been encouraged to go, but there are also other areas where they're not. And uh, and I don't know what you think about Tasmania, but Hobart's on the list and no laws isn't, you know? Um, for the mortgage stress or for the... For, for the airline tickets. Oh, airline tickets. Okay, okay. Yeah, no, I, I, I think you're going to have the uh, great border divide there as always um <laughs> uh, yeah so so the point is yeah there are limited things that the government is planning to do and they're talking about for example offering loans to small businesses to enable them to keep trading but all my research says that the very small businesses who effectively are struggling will not be able to and do not want to commit further to more loans they're more likely to turn around and say time to close so i think we've got to watch for the unemployment rate to go up and potentially for the small business um, defaults and closures to rise. Remember, that, of course, over the last year, those numbers were very, very low because basically we're allowed, people were allowed to trade insolvent. Well, that's all now changed. Yeah. So I think my message is we're not out of this yet. This has still got some way to go. And, of course, it's predicated on the vaccine getting rolled out and the virus continuing to be under control and the borders ultimately opening. Yeah. Only government could uh, see that the north of Tasmania has the uh, higher rate of uh, people on JobKeeper and then not do the subsidy there. So uh, that's government yeah. thinking for you, Mark. And, and, you know, it is, I, I just want to underscore again, it's really important that people look at the detail where job the JobKeeper lives, right? The postcode level analysis is the only way to really understand what's going on because there are some horrible hotspots around the place. Yeah.
Okay. Property prices uh, record in some places here for the December quarter last year. Uh, what do you think about all this, Martin? It's kind of what we've always predicted. And some people were saying in the comments, oh, you know, Nugget, you're, you're always doom and gloom on property. But not really, guys. I've always said that if we follow the track of everywhere else, if we go to 0% interest rates and print money, stocks are going to go up, property is going to go up. It's going to be a bubble just like everywhere else. Yes, and the fact of the matter is that um, the data from Domain and from CoreLogic and now from the ABS, who basically relies on CoreLogic data, shows that there was a significant spike in the fourth quarter, uh, pretty much across the country, you know, the, the major centres and regional centres. Now, got to be careful because those aggregate numbers don't tell you the full story. What we do know is that most of the growth was actually in houses rather than apartments. And that in some areas, in regional areas, the growth was a lot stronger than, for example, closer into the CBDs of Sydney and Melbourne, right? So you've got to be careful with decoding what this information means. I still know of a lot of units and apartments where prices are down 20 to 25% from where they were in 2017. And even in Perth, where there was a price rise, most house prices and uh, unit prices are still lower compared with where they were in 2013. So we just need to put all of this in, in context, right? And then we need to understand that there is a whole bunch of reasons, low interest rates, government incentives, you know, the home builder package, the home and land support, uh, you know, all the state stimulus as well, as to why people are piling in. A lot of first-time buyers, of course, the first-time buyer rate was very high. But what's worrying about that is that the debt levels are rising. A lot of first-time buyers are highly geared up. And interestingly, I did some work which will come out, in fact, tomorrow in the AFR relating to the bank of mum and dad. And the bank of mum and dad has really shot up again. So a lot of first-time buyers are getting money from parents to buy into the property market. So the question is, how sustainable are these rises? And will they go on? Remember, of course, the Reserve Bank's modelling a few years ago said that it's likely that if Price, if, if our rates drop 100 basis points, then essentially that means that over three years, price has got 30%. It could well be that we see something similar to that. Who knows? But the fact of the matter is um, there are debt issues that we've got to consider as well as just pricing issues. And so this is not necessarily good. And by the way, it also means that affordability has gone through the floor. So affordability is a lot worse than it was as well for many people. So this is not universally good news. No, that's the, that's the big headache and just... Again, the RBA just talking out both sides of their mouth when they're saying things like house prices aren't, um, you know, I'm not sure what the word is. You know, they've said they're not in a bubble, but they've also said that they're not even like um, ele elevated or unaffordable. It's kind of like how on earth, like what, how are you going to describe them while you tell people there's no wage growth for over 10 years and their wages aren't going to go up, but housing is going to go up 30%, but it's a good thing. And, oh. Well, and just remember this. The house price index and housing costs don't directly go into the CPI, right? A rental proxy is used and rents haven't gone up. In fact, rents are still falling in a number of areas. So what that says that the CPI is not representing reality when it comes to what's really going on, right? That's the first point. The other one is that um, if you look at the wealth effect, so the next slide, you know, the overall value of property has gone up considerably, you know, and I think the average is around what seven hundred fifty thousand across Australia. That's not that's not uniformly spread. So the point is, it's changing in different locations. In regional areas, prices in houses have gone up a lot. In areas closer to the city, less so. In the high growth corridors, hardly anything. So this is a patchwork quilt again. And so unfortunately, people just get carried away with these high level numbers. But I think you're right. The Reserve Bank is actually caught between. Yeah, we want people to spend, we want people to feel wealthy, so we want prices to go up. But we also now are talking about risks. And Lois said the other day, well, you know, the Council of Financial Regulators will be considering the risks in the housing market. Now, the Council of Financial Regulators is loads other brain, right? Because he's the chair of the Council of Financial Regulators as well, right? Which includes APRA and ASIC and a couple of the hangers on, right? So we've got this really weird duality where on one hand, the Reserve Bank is thinking X over here and over there, they're thinking Y. Yeah, and that rolls into this next slide about um, the transfers uh, higher in regional areas of the um, you know, property and the turnover. And we've already heard even some states propose different things to um, uh, what's the tax call, call, Martin, that they want to bring Stamp up? duty. 
Oh, they want to replace stamp yeah. duty with this yes. new tax, like a, an annual housing Correct. tax. Correct. Or- so, yeah. So, in New South Wales now, people can choose whether to pay stamp duty one off or whether you actually pay each year, right? And other states, and WA is arguing about it, and other states as well. But the interesting, just on those transfers, statistically speaking, the transfer levels were slightly higher in 2020 relative to 2019, but not dramatically. Yeah. But what's also interesting is the relativity between um, the capital cities and the rest of state, right? So we know there's a lot of transactions going on out from the major centres because people were moving out. People wanted to get away from the, uh, you know, the virus, and uh, with the virtuality that's now around, people kind of you know, do what they want to do in regional areas. And I'm in a regional area and love it and wouldn't ever want to go back into the CBDs. Um, so it's really quite interesting just watching the, the switcheroo. And, of course, the interesting question is, will this continue or will people then turn back and say, oh, no, no, I need to be bigger, uh, you know, I need to be closer to those bigger centres again now. Not sure. Yeah. No, I'm definitely quite happy as well in the regional area. Uh, and yeah, with those tax, it's it's a little bit like, oh, we're not making as much as we used to, so we've changed the rules. Um, you know, heads we win, tails you lose sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah and, and you've got to ask the question, if you do switch from um, stamp duty to, uh, you know, a continuous tax, how do you fill the void? Now, New South Wales has tried to sort of keep both ends of the option open, right, by saying, well, you can choose, right? Over time, they hope that more people will transition to ongoing payments over the years but of course the other thing to bear in mind is at least you know what the stamp duty is if you pay it all up front you've no idea what the forward looking uh, take will be because they, i'm sure they'll put the rate up later right so basically what you're doing is you're opening yourself to an ongoing exposure relating to the uh, duty that you pay on your property yeah a little bit like car registration it just creeps up um, <laughs> yeah. it's not in line um, with cpi toll, either is it it's at their no. discretion toll toll bridge charges also yeah springs yep. to mind um high risk lending and we, we've seen this tick over uh, this is another just a uh, result of all the things that there's they're doing to try and say hey ha- first home owners here's your 50 grand um blah blah blah, blah or 95 percent down don't worry about it and all of a sudden these things are starting to show up in the statistics absolutely and interestingly the APRA data came out again to to to, to december and showed that loan-to-value ratios are rising, so there's more high-risk lending. Debt-to-income ratios are rising. And so what that means is that the banks are actually lending more riskier than previously. Now, everyone's saying, oh, it's only a sort of a little uptick. But look, trajectorily, that's very concerning. Also, interest-only loans are up, right? So all of the high-risk indicators, which APRA and the Reserve Bank were trying to control two years ago in and around the um, Royal Commission, are suddenly going the wrong way again, right? Now, that is something which to me says at some point the Council of Financial Regulators, you know, loads other brain, will have to do something about this. They won't do it immediately because they want credit growth. And overall credit growth is still quite low. It was up a little bit, but people have been paying down their mortgages as well because they had free cash. So the net growth is still quite low. But nevertheless, this is a leading indicator in my mind of more pressure ahead. And uh, the Frank is... Frank, frankly, there are a lot of people I've been speaking to who've got loans that are eight times the income, eight times. That is horribly high, and there's no wriggle room if for any reason you know the incomes get compressed. Exactly, yeah. That uh, The trend was, what, between three and five, like income housing ratio in other countries, it's still in that sort of band. And when Sydney I, and when I was a... Tend, yeah, when I was a, when a, a lender in, in a bank years and years ago, it was three and a half to four times was reasonable, right? And then it went up five, six, seven, eight, and you know, eight times is is there now. And the trouble is that um, you know people will say, well, you know, I can probably afford it today, but you know, hopefully in a few years' time, my income is going to grow and that will make it easier. Now, in the early two thousands, when those ratios started to move high, people's income growth was actually quite strong. But since 2011-12, as I said earlier, there's been no real income growth. And there's very little prospect of income growth ahead. So you've got to be thinking your ability to service those mortgages will require, you know, a lot of income for a long time. And the other point, interest rates are really, really low, right? And they'll probably stay low for a time. But if those bond rates were signaling rates going higher, 
Some people are suggesting that maybe mortgage rates will have to go higher sooner than many people think. So I always say to people, if you're thinking about um, doing a calculation based on you know, your, 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 your current situation, don't just use the current available mortgage rate, but ask yourself the question, what happens if rates go up a couple of percent? Because the chances are, over the next five years, rates will be higher than they are today. Yes, exactly. Uh, all right, mortgage stress uh, higher again in Feb. Yeah, and this was a surprise. So it went back in in January, and I was thinking, well, here you go. So you people are coming back into work, and you know things are looking right. But it jumped yes. up in February, and that's partly because of the job keeper changes and more people going back to work. Partly because the cost of living are rising. Partly because they got bigger mortgages, uh, and partly because some people refinanced and actually pulled down a bigger mortgage, um, which then had trouble even servicing immediately. So unfortunately. If you believe that the cliff is still there at the end of March, and we've talked about JobKeeper, but we should also talk about the end of the principal and interest repayment holidays. We should talk about some of the other things which are also coming to an end too. So it looks to me as though we're going to see an uptick probably in stress for the next few months. Remember, stress is cash flow. So this is about measuring how people are faring with money in, money out. And it comes back to my fundamental view that there's you know one and a half million people who are just about clinging on with regard to their mortgage at the moment but it doesn't take much to see that that could change and whilst there are many people saying well i don't see what the problem is because everything's fine i've you know i've never been out of work and uh, my income's still bouncing along and i'm doing well on the stock market so there's a section of the economy doing really well top end of the k but there's also another leg of the k where people are still really feeling it you know one and a half million in mortgage stress and interestingly other research has also shown about a third of the population very much financially strapped at the moment and then if you add in also some of the older people who still have mortgages but uh, are not getting much income from the income on deposits because the interest rates are so low you can be understand that why some of them may be having issues so there are still below the waterline significant stress fractures in people's household budgets yeah. and that's concerning yeah as martin said particularly because it's still you know it's not march it's not until the next uh month's data where we're actually removing all of these measures that like the COVID emergency measures and so if we're already seeing an uptick when we're just about to change those rules and the, the you know repayment holidays blah 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 um who knows what that spike's going to look like next month yeah. And that sort of just takes us to the last slide, which says, look, I still run my different, different scenarios. Um, I am becoming more and more of the view that over the next two or three year house prices will continue to rise because the Reserve Bank will continue to do QE. They've pretty much said as much, you know, more more bond purchases. They could well target uh, the next duration of, of bond uh, out at the three year level. Um, some people were suggesting they might even go up further down the yield curve uh, using um, yield uh, curve controls doesn't look as though they're going there yet, but they, they might ultimately. So I'm, think, I'm thinking we're going to see rates really, really low, mortgage rates low, but there is still an alternative counter view that says, well, what happens if the virus doesn't go away? What happens if we actually start seeing more cases and, you know, particularly some of those uh, more virulent strains come into Australia, particularly if, if we open the borders? What happens if the vaccines uh, aren't quite as effective as people hope? So there are some, you know, counter views too. And the bigger question is... What happens if the QE programs around the world don't actually lead to the outcomes that we expect? In the process, we actually cr create, if you like, financial system disruption. And if we get financial system disruption, that could actually have significant negative impacts. So my scenarios are more you know, bullish than they were, but I'm still conscious that there are alternative scenarios there. And in those alternative scenarios, home prices would not continue to rise. They would actually perhaps go backwards. Yeah. I might just finish off with my little rant about um, like yield curve control. And so we've <laughs> spoken about um, QE, which is basically the central banks printing money out of thin air to buy bonds off banks. And the theory is that, hey, buy those assets off banks, um, you know, top up their reserves, they'll lend more. But it just it just doesn't happen. It's such a back to front system. And you think about, well, now yield curve control, they're saying, well, we're going to target this section of the yield curves that keep interest rates low at the three year mark, as well as our you know target rate where we set 
um, set interest rates and then the, the longer end of the curve is more to do with the market and whatnot. But if you think about how the other day they had to do $4 billion uh, in Australia, you know that's an enormous number in one day yep. just to get this number on a screen lower. And, and that number on a screen, again, it's not doing anything. It's just the smoke and mirrors to make the data look better. And if you think about, well, imagine if we had this problem where they spent four billion dollars and we had too much you know science research or or too many hospitals and they weren't overstaffed like that's billions of dollars that could be spent on anything even if it's just giving it to people to go out and encouraging them um, to spend locally or go on a holiday or whatever it is i can just think of a hundred ways to get the economy going better or to help the majority of people that is not printing money out of thin air to buy government bonds which again are just a out of thin air sort of contraption and it's all just going through the banking system to give the banks more money and to lend but to lend to who the only people borrowing are you know the speculators or the banks themselves they can't speculate with that money directly but they can rob peter to pay paul so these days because the banks are just in um in the business of lending to people residential they can say oh we've got this extra money now well now we can speculate more in that other section of the bank and we can go out and buy more apple stock like we see some of these even central banks doing these days so it is just the the biggest level of craziness for anyone this is why they don't teach it in school i think mark because anyone that understands this stuff would be out on the street protesting saying um I demand that all money printing, uh, an equal amount goes to the people as goes to the banks or, or something mm. like that. It's just so lopsided, it, uh, it makes no sense whatsoever. Well, I absolutely support that view. And, you know, you and I both believe that that money could have been so much better invested in the real economy in Australia to lay a foundation for, you know, a, a better society ahead and actually it's one where there is more value being created for real ordinary Australians. Unfortunately, what's been going on is the um, Financial System Preservation Society, right? Yes. Where effectively the, the the money is going into the system to support the system, to support the system, right? And everyone's worried about financial stability and all those things. And you know, to give you another angle on that, responsible lending legislation was due to be withdrawn. Um, at the end of March, right? Actually, it didn't go through the Senate because the Senate's now started asking harder questions about why would you would want to remove consumer protections. But it's a really archetypal debate about what's really important. Is really important financial stability of the financial system, which is what APRA is responsible for and what they're now saying is really important, or is it down to what real people and real consumers are doing and making sure that consumers have the right protections but also the right opportunities, right? And that is, for me, the linchpin of the debate we should be having because the policies that are being rolled out through the Reserve Bank, and I would also argue through um, the government too, are not benefiting the bulk of Australians. Yeah. And until we can actually get that message out and get people to understand that there has to be an alternative approach if we to actually lay the foundation for you, we're going to go around the same houses as you know, Japan has done, the Eurozone has done, the Fed has done. And the worry is you end up with a bigger burden of debt, um, more quantitative easing, but not a better real economy. And that's what we need. Yes. And all this money that's floating around, it's like musical chairs. If people <laughs> and people are starting to decide to run for the real things, and whether it's Russia and China and those people that don't like the system, they haven't liked the US based system for many years. And you see them stockpiling gold, but now they're stockpiling, you know, oil, commodities, lumber, all, all this other stuff, like rare earth minerals. And so it's the same everywhere. But if that happens on the on the retail consumer level in the everyday economy where people start running for real things, that's when you get hyperinflation. So hopefully all these moving parts people are really starting to understand now, Martin, with uh, everything we've discussed. And it's why I, you've seen you know gold, Bitcoin, even some people are arguing that like shares and stocks to some degree are more scarce than all this funny money that's just been printed into oblivion. So money's going to continue to just flow into everywhere and everything at the moment. Well, the trouble is that there are risks pretty much wherever you look, even in the stocks, even in gold, you know, wherever you look, right, there are risks. There's no such thing as a free lunch, right? Yeah. But I, what I would say is, Alex, that people want more control of their own destiny, right? And I come back to that. That's why I think the crypto thing is quite interesting, because there is a narrative that says 
you've got control, Be your which own you bank. haven't got exactly right, which you haven't got anywhere else. And that's one of the reasons why, if you look at like Ethereum and those sorts of things, and you know the the, the whole financial plays and you know the the individual financial models that begin to, are beginning to exist, that for me is really interesting because mm-hmm. it signals potentially an alternative future. Yeah, we should probably do an episode about that on DFA, Martin, all the financial sort of protocols that are yeah. out there. But um, yeah, that's been You're an on. awesome we'll episode, a, fa- a fairly long one. But uh, no, it's still under an hour, but uh, nice and juicy for you guys. I hope you've enjoyed that. Uh, thanks for joining us, Martin, and we'll definitely have to do it again next month. Look forward to it. Cool. Thanks, guys.